Good morning, everybody. Welcome again for this uh, new seminar here at the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Alvaro Alvaro Alvarez Candal, and he will talk about the new phases in uh, the many phases in the asteroid. So Alvaro, uh, he got the degree in astronomy by the University of Córdoba in Argentina in 2002. Then the PhD in astronomy by the National Observatory in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in 2006. He's been postdoc at the Paris Observatory, Lesia in France, and the European Southern Observatory in Chile between 2007 and 2013. Then he moved to Brazil in 2013 with a research position where he stayed until 2019. Just before the pandemics, he moved to Spain, where he uh, contract of uh, Doctor Distinguido at the Alicante University on 2020. And he became a Severo Cho postdoc in 2021. Her career has been focused on observations of small bodies from asteroid to trans-Neptunian objects, using photometric and spectroscopic techniques in the visual to near infrared. So thank you very much, Alvaro, for being here. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Alvaro. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be giving this seminar. And first of all, I would like to congratulate the Institute for the new Severo Cho accreditation. I think that's, that's a great new. And uh, well, it's going to be awesome for the Institute and for the people that will cover it up. Sorry, not, I'm not sharing my screen, so... Oh, no, I'm not sharing. Um, this I think now it's showing, yes. Oh, good. thank you. Gracias. Um, uh, so oh, that this this uh, I'm, I'm going to show you the results of a few works that uh, we've been carrying out for the last few years since 2016, in particular. And first, now this thing doesn't work. I'd like to ah, okay. I would just like to to show the people that's been involved in this. Uh, people from Brazil, from, from here, from Spain, and from, from a few other places. Some of them were students at the time, and some others are still students, and uh, a few of them are not anymore in science as well. Uh, just a short outline. I, I'd like to do an, an introduction of the topic, speaking mostly about the small bodies, just to hopefully move smoothly to what the phase curves are. So it's going to be the, the main topic of this, of this talk. And then uh, speak directly of the work that I've done with asteroids, TNO, and coming back to asteroids as well to do some concluding remarks at the end. So, small bodies are asteroids, comets, and transcendental objects. This is a picture of uh, basically the of the of the of the population of small bodies. This is just taken from the Minor Planet Center uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, don't mind the colors. This is just to show you that we have objects that. Move from that are from the from inner Earth objects to the main belt to the transcendental region. Here we can see mean motion resonances, uh, the Jupiter trojans, uh, mean motion resonances as well in the transcendental region. The central population objects that are, that are being scattered by Neptune right now. Uh, so this is a, a very complex picture of different kind of objects all spread in the in the solar system uh, and. Any model of the solar system we want to develop must explain the thing we are looking right now. This is over a million objects, and it's going to keep increasing when further future surveys start to release more data, like the LST or things like that. This is going to be a lot more crowded than it looks right now. Uh, in this talk, uh, I'm going to include the dwarf planets as small bodies, because why not? I mean, they're just six or seven you know, uh, uh, dwarf planets discovered. And this is a, a new definition we made up in 2006. So I'm going to just consider them as small bodies and go on from there. Uh, as I mentioned, this distribution of, uh, 
of uh, proper of uh, orbital of orbits we see now, and this is in some major axis and eccentricity space, should be explained by any 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 model we make of the of the evolution of the solar system. This is a nice picture, rather schematic, but very nice, uh, published by Deneo and Carri in 2014, which basically shows what's the current paradigm of the, of the evolution of the, of the solar system. Uh, we know that the giant planets migrated uh, early in the, in the late stages of the formation of the, of the, of the solar system, when there, there was still some gas left in the disk, the planets were migrating inwards, and migration type two, I think it was, uh, due to the mass, Jupiter was migrating uh, faster than, uh, than the rest of them. Uh, at some point, uh, Saturn fell in the gap that uh, Jupiter uh, opened, and it caught up with Jupiter. And they got captured in the mean motion resonance. I, I, if I remember correctly, it was the one to two mean motion resonance. And when this happened, due to this particular configuration that Jupiter is a, is a very massive and it was an inner planet, the motion reversed. So this is, it sounds crazy, but it, dynamically it can happen. So instead of migrating inwards uh, in the presence of gas, they started migrating outwards. When they do this, they start, uh, they, they start a very chaotic epoch of the, of, the, of the solar system. Something similar happened to the external planets. They migrated, in, they migrated inward, they, they, they fell into a mean motion resonance and started migrating outwards. This migration stops when the, the, when the gas dissipates from the disk. Once the gas dissipates, we are left with the planetesimals that will form in the disk, the protoplanets, and well, the massive, the, the massive giant planets. And then it starts a new uh, migration, which we already proposed in the 80s by Fernandez and Ip, which is called uh, migration by planetesimals. It's just the planetesimals left, they, they interact gravitationally with, with the giant planets and interchange angular momentum and they move. When this uh, stage happens, the, the only one, the only giant planet that is able to, to to eject objects from the solar system is Jupiter. So it's the only one that migrates inwards a little bit due to its big mass, it migrates just a little bit. The other three planets, they, they migrate outwards, especially uh, Neptune and, and Uranus. Uranus and Neptune. And uh, when this happens, they, they, encounter, they encounter the planetesimals which are scrambled all over the solar system. So objects that were initially in the outskirts you say uh, transneptunian object could be placed into in, inner orbits like in the in the main belt and objects from the main belt were certainly uh, ejected from the from the inner solar system to the outer parts uh, this kind of migration is not smooth it's it's granular so it needs to be granular to be able to explain uh, a few other things like for example for instance uh, the possible presence of more than, than four giant planets than more than more than four giant planets in particular, six or seven, uh, a fifth or a sixth uh, giant ice planets, more, more similar than Uranus and Neptune than to Jupiter and, and, and Saturn. When this migration happens, as you see here, this is the grainier and needs giving these little jumps happening whenever one of these giant planets encounters a planetesimal. Depending on the mass of the planetesimal, the jump can be big or small. So at some point, one of these hypothetical fifth or sixth planet might have encountered a massive planetesimal that put, puts it into an orbit that may take it into a, an encounter with Jupiter. If this happens, Jupiter will kick it out. So this is supposed to happen in the solar system. And when these things happen, when this planet is rejected, where there is a massive uh, chaos in the system, and this explains a lot of features that we see today, like the, the presence of the some irregular satellites, the, the mixing of of, um, of primitive asteroids in the in, in the Indian belt, on the the current distribution of the the, 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 the mean motion resonances in the in the external solar system, and things like that. But again, this is uh, hypothetical. In the end, what we want, or what I would like to to understand better. It's the current distribution of uh, minor bodies in the solar system. This is this is just uh, the main belt on the Trojan and the Trojan region. I would like to extend this up to the to the outskirts, as I, as I show you in the first figure. And this is the, an unbiased picture of uh, the these letters here are the let's say they associate with the, the, the kind of spectra the object ha the object has. S, C, D, and the most S and C are the most common. The S it's a, it's a, let's say it's a more rocky object. The sea are more primitive objects. I'm not gonna get into this one because they, they are marginal populations and they, um, 
and they don't appear very often. These are the most important in terms of numbers. I want to, to, to stress this in, term, in terms of numbers. So uh, we see that the, the objects that looks more rocky, let's say, they tend to dominate in the inner parts where the objects that look more primitive, say they start appearing in the external parts. And, uh, but it, it, overall, there is a great mix of objects here. This, Taxonomical classes, which is these are the color based on, on, on the spectra or photospectra, depends uh, if you uh, usually we are working more with photospectra because we have more data, so we can have better statistics. But these things are based on observa on individual observations, so at most two, three observations of the same object in different places. And what's currently done is taking an average on a more weighted average or some things like that. This, I will try to convince you by the end that this is not strictly correct because there is an effect that we know that the, that the spectrum may change its shape, it's especially if it's, it's a slope when observing different uh, geometrical configurations. So in principle, this is very nice and this works nicely and it's very approximate to what reality is, but there is a bias here that's not being considered and that should be uh, included in, in, in any taxonomical in any taxonomical classification, and this was mentioned. This was mentioned by Karim Munone in, in the in the meeting in the meeting in the Severo Ochoa meeting we had a, a few weeks ago, and it was the first time I heard someone saying it out loud. Uh, how we study the minor bodies? Well, I, I'm an observer, and I'm not a theoretician. I'm an observer, so I'm going to just speak about observations here. Uh, there are basically two ways you can do this, either from the Earth, okay, uh, or nearby the Earth, and doing the, the common, the, the usual, the usual uh, using on one of the usual techniques, photometry, spectroscopy, for anything over a broad wavelength range from the ultraviolet to the infrared, and, and so on and so forth, or wherever you can have a window, you can observe uh, within our atmosphere, or you can do it in situ using spacecraft. We can go to some of these subjects and actually do very nice studies there. But I'm not going to speak about spacecraft here because uh, I want to have a big picture. I want to look at this from far away and see big structures. Spacecraft are awesome. They provide a lot of information, very detailed information, but of a handful of objects that they can be placed into the context of uh, a more generic um, picture, let's say, but they don't give this uh, smoother thing I want to see. Yeah? I want to identify structures in the large scale. I don't want to just focus on one particular object. I don't want to know a lot about one thing. I want to know a lot about a bunch of things to be able to do statistics. In particular, in this, in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on photometric studies over a broad Wavelength, broad, uh, wavelength range, or at least as broad as possible. Uh, but before getting into the photometry, we have I have to speak about brightness variation because I'm going to be studying these things, brightness variations and their sources. So we have to be able to tune the bright, the, these uh, variations to see, to understand what are they, uh, wh wh where do they come from or how, and how we deal with them. The first source of variation is the rotation of the body. This is very schematic. Let's say flux is in this uh, scale and time in this scale. This is an irregular asteroid. You can think is this about the case. Okay. And when it's rotating, it's changing. It's, it's, a, it's a reflecting area. We are seeing reflected, reflected light. So when it's the maximum area, we see the maximum flux. Then it rotates 90 degrees and we have a minimum of area. And a minimum flux and so on and so forth till the object completes a rotation and we have its rotation period and its amplitude. It can be as up as, as uh, this amplitude can be as high as three magnitudes in some cases, or it can be as low as, as almost zero in some others. Another source of brightness variation is a change of aspect angle. The aspect angle is the angle between the line of sight and the rotation axis. Uh, the rotation axis, let, let's assume there is no notation nor precession, so the rotation axis is fixed in space. So when you, if you're observing the object here, you're going to observe one aspect angle, let's say 45 degrees. When the object moves into this position of the orbit, I'm going to have an angle of 90 degrees. So this changes how the rotation is seen 
So it changes the amplitude of the light curve and it changes the rotation, the, the amplitude I'm going to be seeing. So this is a source of brightness variation. Uh, no, not this button. It doesn't work. And last but not the least, phase curve. So the brightness of an object here, it changes due to the changing distances to the sun, which is emitting the light that's going to be reflected by the object, and the distance from the object to the earth, with, with, with there is the detector, the observer. These two effects can be removed just by normalizing it, and we obtain what we call the reduced magnitude. Okay, then we are just left with one variation that is the variation in the phase angle, which is the phase angle is basically the, the angular distance between the earth and the sun as seen from the object, and it gives us a, a proxy of the of the fraction of the of the of the surface that's been that's illuminated and seen as, as seen by the, by the earth. And this is the things I'm interested in how the brightness of this object changes when changes the phase angle. These are things that has been studied in the 50s. Uh, this is a seminal work by, by girls. Uh, on this, I think this was Masali, the asteroid 20 Masalia. And uh, he saw, and we'll be plotting this reduced magnitude, remove the effects of the distance, and remove also the effect of variation of the rotational variations. They the, 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 the plot the phase curve that's plot has this shape. It's not a linear that was supposed to be, okay? But it has a, a, a surge at low phase angles. So the phase curve is composed of this linear part, this surge, which is called the opposition effect, which is a combination of, of two phenomena. First, when you're getting into the opposition, you're getting into a configuration when you are the, 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 the source, the observer and the object aligned. So there is a, a, a minimum of, of shadows that you see in the object as well as there is a physical effect, which is a coherent back, back scattering, uh, which is uh, two, uh, two rays of light going in the same direction, but, but in opposite sense, they tend to interfere, producing an, an increase in the, in the, in the brightness. Uh, what's important of this code as well is where it cuts the y-axis, which provides the absolute magnitude of the object. For a, for a solar system or for a minor body, the absolute magnitude, it relates to its size and its uh, albedo, which is how the light is being reflected off the surface. So this is why absolute magnitudes are important, because if we know, have an estimation of the albedo, we may estimate or have a decent estimation of its diameter. Its diameter is one of the key uh, properties to know the, the, these objects, because tied with the mass, we get densities and, and stuff like that. From the phase curves, we have the relation between the apparent magnitude, again, normalized by the distances. And this is a function of the absolute magnitude, the phase angle, and a series of parameters that I generically call G here. And these parameters depend on the photometric model that's going to be adopted to describe these curves. Uh, the IAU, the current IAU accepted model is the AG1, G2, but this works well when you have a very dense. Uh, coverage of the phase curve and uh, a very high quality of the data, which is usually not the case. So I rely on the AG12 asterisk, uh, AG star, AG12 star model by, by Cantil et al. in 2016, which works better in uh, a more sparse, sparse coverage of the curves and not so high quality. And, and it, works, it works really well. Of course, there are other models as well. You can a lot of people that works either on empirical models or on physical models like Hapke or Shkuratov and things like that. Uh, Shevchenko as well. Uh, how we work with phase curves? Uh, there is a traditional way. Traditional way is I request for observing time. I go, I select my list of targets and I observe them. I need to observe them at the phase angle depends. It's a, the, the, the angular distance between the earth and the, and the sun as observed from the object. So I have to observe this in many different positions of the orbit of the object. So I need a lot of time to do this, unless I'm observing an object near, near to the Earth that changes its position very fast. If I'm going to the, to the main belt or to the trans region, I need a lot of time to, to do this kind of curves. But the good thing of this strategy is that can, I can choose which objects I want to, observe, want to observe. I know which phase angles I'm going to observe it, and I control a lot of the observation as a tap filters, uh, extinction, etc. 
quality of the night and, and whatever. All of this is very, very controlled, so I can create very nice uh, face tools like this one of Misa, Maribelskaya and Shevchenko. And there is a new approach, well, let's say new, that's become available to us thanks to the to the availability uh, because of the large photometric surveys. Uh, this technique relies on serendipitous observations. So these surveys observe the sky uh, with different techniques, with different strategies, because one of them are extragalactic, others are dedicated to cosmology, or a few of them are dedicated to small bodies, but they cover the sky. Uh, the minor bodies happen to, the small bodies happen to be there, usually as contamination. Uh, there is people working within each survey or most of the surveys that plug these moving objects, link them to minor bodies and provide this as a extra value catalogs that are used by the community. When you do that, you provide us with, they provide us with this sort of data. Uh, there, here, there's no control over when the object was observed or where the object was observed. We have to do with, we have to deal, uh, to work with what we have, but it, it can be done and the, well, this is a very nice case of the Atlas, uh, the Atlas survey. Uh, this was published by, by Nike and collaborators. Um, the, the advantage of this is that it provides with a lot of objects. Because a, a survey that's been observing for a few years, the whole sky is going to observe a lot of asteroids in a lot of different positions. And uh, we're going to have a lot of coverage. So that's very nice. And we're going to have a many, many, many objects, a lot more than we can cover in a traditional way. Let's say traditional in a way that, in, meaning I go to the telescope with my target list and I observe them. Uh, the data is usually already calibrated. The problem is that the observations are taken at an unknown rotational pace. They just, they, the, the object happens to cross the, the, the field of view and it's observed. So I don't know in which moment of the, you remember uh, the sinusoidal variation. I don't know if it was maximum and minimum or, or in the middle. In principle, to do face curve, you have to have the average or, or one, or you have to remove the effect of, of variations. And uh, by, for the most of the main service, the most important service, minor bodies are usually contamination, although it's becoming more and more important to, to every survey. Most of them have working groups on, 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 on working on pipelines that are going to flag and link to minor bodies and provide this. And this is going to be awesome. There is also, uh, another issue I want to mention, it's not strictly related with this, but uh, because I want to come to the, the my, 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 my main motivation. There is a, a, a known phenomenon that's known, uh, known as a uh, phase reddening, which is, this is done with a laboratory spectrum of uh, laboratory spectra of um, meteorites. That whenever you observe a, a given spectrum at different phase angles here increasing, there is a change not only in the depth of the source of the of the bands, but also in the overall slope. Let's say if you fit a, a linear slope here, it's, in this case it's becoming redder. So an object of uh, observed at different phase angles may not have the same color. If you observe it at 30 degrees, it may not be exactly the same as if you observe it at a position at zero degree. So this is this has to be taken into account whenever you are trying to make a, a compositional description of the solar system, of the, of, of the population of minor bodies of the solar system. So I wanted to keep in mind that current taxonomies, meaning let's say taxonomies specular types are biased because they are based mostly on snapshots. One observation at one random phase angle, I make it in here, I say, this is an object, a rocky object, this is an icy object, this is primitive, this has this kind of spectrum with that one. But it may change. We know it may change a different phase. Mm -hmm. And we also want data at the broad wave and range to be able, in particular, with photometry to emulate what we do with spectroscopy. Spectro spectro spectroscopic uh, surveys are a lot less massive than photometric surveys. That's the, the, main, the main thing here. So what we try to do, or what we did, okay, we went, we went to the Sloan Moving Object Catalog, which is a, a value-added catalog of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, added, increased by the by Korean collaborators in 2016. From there, we extracted information of about 140,000 objects with this uh, criteria. There is a new catalog I want to mention by Sergei Evan Kari, where they reanalyzed all 
data the Sloan of uh, so the, the photometric catalog of Sloan, including data that has that was not included here that was taken after the last release of the moving object catalog, providing over a million uh, over a million objects with the catalog magnitude. Uh, I'm not I, I didn't use this. But I started all this before this was public, and I'm I'm analyzing I'm analyzing it right now. Uh, but it's going to take some time because if this process, as you will see, it's not particularly fast. Uh, so basically, I'm sticking to data. I want to have at least three data points with errors in the magnitude less than one, say, and uh, coverage in phase angle of at least five degrees. So I say that uh, rotational variations are important to be considered. As I don't know, I, I think. One observation of one object, I don't know which rotation of phase it was taken. I don't know if it's a maximum, a minimum, or in the middle. So what I did uh, was to try to, to create the probability distribution of all the rota possible rotation states for that object. Uh, I went to the database of, uh, of all light curves provided by Wagner and collaborators. In, well, this is the reference, but it's, it's, gonna, it's, it's updated uh, periodically. And with a, an a priori estimation of the absolute magnitude in the B filter, done with uh, just assuming the nominal, the nominal errors of the, in the magnitude, I computed the probability distribution for every object in my list for over 20,000 objects or something like that. Uh, with this uh, a priori, with this probability of the possible rotational states of these objects, I construct, I, 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 I convolve, convolve with the probability, with the, basically with the probability distribution of the magnitude, which is basically a, a Gaussian with a, with, a, with a width of a sigma. I know that for the Sloan object, the Gaussian is not a correct approach, but it's uh, good enough. Uh, basically, this is so this is a picture is worth more than, 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 than equations. Basically, this the, the, the black line is the probability distribution of the rotational states. Uh, so it may it, the object may have an amplitude in the light curve between minus 0.5 and 1.5, more probably in this region. The red curve shows the, the probability distribution of the, of the magnitude. This is being just put into zero to make it clear. And the convolution, well, it gives this thing here, which is as convolving with the Gaussian, it just tends to smooth out the probability distribution of the rotational states. Uh, so uh, to compute the phase curves, I, I extracted I, I extracted the data for each object for each of the five filters of the Sloan of the Sloan catalog. I extracted um, and, and did a Monte Carlo simulation using the blue curve as the as the as a source. I mean, I'm extracting randomly data from the blue curve. That's what I'm doing. I'm constructing probability distributions in the space parameters that, that I'm using the model. The model of Pentila uses two, two basically two parameters, H and G, and, um, and this is the probability distribution. From this probability distribution, that this is because it's a Monte Carlo, it's a, it's a, it's quantified. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's not it's not continuous. It's a discrete. That's the thing I want to say. Uh, we obtain a lot of solutions that are not physical. So the model allows unphysical solutions. We have to remove this. So the physical, the physical solutions are in red. All the gray parts are not taken into account. So there are thousands of solutions that are not physical. So we remove them. And for the sake of, of our work, uh, left with the, with the option, which one of these values is the one I'm not gonna provide as my nominal. As, uh, in, the, in the end, any of these solution is a good solution. It's a possible solution. So all of them may are, are, are valid. Some of them may be more probable in this region and this is very unlikely, but it's a real solution. It may happen. So in the end, I just choose the median of the, of the, of the space as my nominal, as, as the nominal, the nominal results. All the all the probability distribution are stored and you know, available okay, for for the community, and these are the solutions. Uh, this is just a, one object that I use as, a, as my as my, my, my test subject. Then well, the, the name is is on the top. It's ten thirty four T one, and this procedure gives well a reasonably good uh, fit. It's, it's good to remember that the 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 the, the, the curve 
doesn't follow exactly the numbers because I'm providing I'm, I'm, this is using the median of the distribution. So it doesn't, the median not necessarily is the best solution. It's just one solution, the one that separates it, the one that uh, separates the distribution in, in half, basically. Okay, but as I said, any solution in the parameter space is valid. So it can, it, it, it's left to, to whoever uses this to choose which, whichever solution they want to use. Uh, we obtain over 40,000 objects with at least one valid value, with at least one valid uh, value of absolute magnitude in one of these filters, and 12,000 objects with all five uh, magnitude value. That's, that's good. That, that's a, that's a, a very big number. In the end, what we wanted to do, if we also wanted to see if our uh, our magnitudes were uh, where our process uh, processing was okay, if we were doing fine, we compare with a very dense uh, database by by Beres, uh, obtained with PanStats. We have like eight thousand object, objects in common, and the agreement is fairly good. Our magnitudes tend to be a little bit uh, brighter than theirs, but overall, it's it's pretty good. And in the end, what I wanted. What we wanted was to create these sort of plots. These are uh, color color diagrams uh, in the using absolute colors, not or now not colors taken at one random snapshot, at one random rotation of phase. These are things are corrected by this. These are let's say intrinsic colors of the objects. And uh, this one in principle it says something, but this one is more interesting because it looks a lot like other plots being plotted and it separates. Well, objects have a deep absorption band in the in 0 0.9 microns, which are the Rene knows a, a lot of this, the V type objects. And here we can see two clumps, one of them associated to the traditionally called S type asteroids, and other to the C type asteroids. We moved further and we wanted to do, as I said, taxonomies are based on, on observations at random. Uh, Phase angle, so they are sort of biased. We wanted to do a taxonomical classification with data at zero phase angle. And this is what we did. This has just been published about a month ago by Milagro Colasso. Uh, we took just with three to four different uh, groups because the quality of the data is still not there. With our error versus our uncertainties are deep, still large. So going into more detail doesn't make much sense. It's going to blur too much. And um, this, with these four, we already have what we want to see in the in the parameter space. And here, very well separated. It was not using machine learning, C fuzzy means by, by Milagros. And here is the, the B types, and here are the C types, the S types, and the X types. And each one of them has a particular um, a particular spectral spectral behavior. These two have absorption features, and these two are more linear, changing its slopes from blue to, to, to red. We started constructing our composite, our, our maps, our DC semi-major axis, and uh, color G minus, G, G minus I, and uh, the slope just uh, fit uh, uh, aligned to the, to the colors. Um, we started to see interesting things like uh, this G, G minus I, it covers the region just before the onset of the absorption feature in those objects that have the, the absorption. So we see that those objects that are very red appear mostly in the inner part of the, of the solar system, while in the outer in the other of, the, of the main belt. Well, going to the outer part of the main belt, we start to see most objects that do not have, that are less red and tend to, to have slopes that are more, more close to, to, to zero. So, they have to be less featured objects, let's say. Uh, there's still a lot to do here because, for instance, we know that farther away we start to, to we should start to see objects that have slopes a lot higher than this, or this should start to dominate. We don't see this because there's very little objects classified as that, and because we this D types object is called they they've been included into the X classification. So there's still room to work here. This is just a first step, and uh, I hope that whenever we get more and more and more data, we can uh, start doing this with uh, with more detail and and and, uh, and getting uh, more insight into into particular features. I'm going to move now a little bit out, keeping into the topic, 
Um, but this is going back in time because these works were previous, uh, were, were published before the what I was speaking before. Uh, in this case, it's related to transitory objects and centaurs. This was the first time we tried to include the effect of the light curve uh, to compute the absolute magnitudes. And it was the first time as well, uh, not that in the literature, in the literature there were already uh, work by Rabinowitz using three filters, but it was the first time that we had a, a massive database, massive, let's say 3000 objects, where with, uh, with using data in two different filters. And we use an homogeneous processing, which I think is, is crucial. For these objects, we can use a, a much simpler photometric model, just a linear, a linear as, assumption, because we are dealing with phase angles for TNOs, uh, seldomly larger than two degrees, and for centaurs, just up to seven degrees. We are in a region where we are within the opposition effect, but in principle, uh, the, the assumption of linearity work relatively well. I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later. Except for a few objects, this is a very recent work, that do have a very strong opposition effect, but it usually happens below 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degrees. And this is, it's very difficult to observe within this, this, this range. So how valid is in the end the, the, the linear modeling? Well, we've done a, a simulation, assuming no errors, because if we uh, put observational errors here, this get a lot blurred. And uh, in principle, for the worst case, worst case scenario, which is this one, which has a, a phase could cover just by three points, which is my, my, my main criteria here in selecting data, we may commit errors in the determination of the absolute magnitude of up to, uh, we may, uh, sorry, we may uh, underestimate the absolute magnitude by 0 0.4 tops. But in general, the median, the median of the, of the, of the, of the difference is below 0 0.2 degrees, uh, 0 0.2 magnitude, sorry. And this is within our, our uncertainty. So, in principle, the linear, the linear approach to describe uh, this nonlinear behavior, always in a restricted phase angle a regime up to seven and a half degrees, works fine if we want to determine the absolute magnitude. It, it's not good to speak about uh, opposition effect because that's a complete different phenomenon. This is physics, and I'm not entering into that. But to obtain absolute magnitudes, the linear behavior is it's, it's good enough. In that, at that time, what we did was to use the, the, the data, the rotational data we have of TNOs. Um, for those that we knew, we used these, these values. And for those we didn't know, which were a lot as well, we uh, computed in beams and used the median in, in, in those beams. So this was the first thing we did. We also did uh, Monte Carlo uh, retrieving. But in this case, the, 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 the rotational probability we assumed was just uniform. The, the probability distribution was uniform, didn't have those dents I showed for asteroids. And we obtained these sort of uh, curves covering this parameter space. This is an example for Aries. Uh, we obtained one, more than 100 objects. Uh, we tested with this data, a lot of uh, relations that were usually uh, put forward by the community like uh, the bimodality of colors for objects smaller than magnet, absolute magnitude seven, or the the, the overall the the, the 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 increase of redder objects in in determined in, deter, in determined regions of the of the outer of the outer belt, and using absolute magnitude, we didn't we didn't see any clear relation. So the main conclusion we took from this was that. Uh, uh, whenever proposing a, a, a new relation or a, a correlation or a predominance or whatever, uh, it should be done using absolute magnitudes and not the snapshots obtained at one particular phase because it may it may bias your result or it may bias your thinking towards something that may not be there. Uh, of course, this was done only with 100 objects. Maybe if we put more of this, more deal, more, if we add more data here, we may start to see some relations, but especially because there is data for a lot more objects, but most of them were such as once or twice at most. I, I want to, 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 to compute this magnitude. I'm using objects that have at least three observations. The only relation that we detected actually was uh, my student at the time, Carmen Azela Loera, who discovered this, was this 
very strong anti-correlation between absolute color and this delta beta. With beta beta is just the the slope in the in the in the linear in the linear function. Uh, it's very strong. It happens for whenever we, you consider small uh, different subsets subsets of data, just centaurs, TNOs. Uh, in, in different uh, semi-major axis beams, etc., in sizes, it, it happens for all of them. So in the end, we conclude that it was common for the Transnetunian population, uh, and as it didn't depend on diameter, no location, no temperature, no, nothing that we could think about. Uh, the only solution we came out was that it depended on the uh, microscopical structure of the surface, uh, especially related to uh, the size of the particles. And that was our conclusion at the time. During the, the PhD examination of Carmen, one of the members of the committee asked her if this happened as well in, in, in asteroids. We said, we don't know, we didn't do this in asteroids. Actually never, as we can observe asteroids up to 30 degrees, we never studied them as just as small phase angles. We just go all the way. So, Inspired by that, we came back to Asteroid with the same. We, we already had the database of the Sloan. And in this, in this case, we restricted to the same range we were observing the TNOs and Asteroids and, 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 and Centaurs and used the same linear model, applying the same, basically the same, the same criteria and the same method developed by us in, in our 22 paper, 22 paper. In this case, we had, as we, we already had the previous paper, we could have used this data as priors to uh, increase the quality of our of our of our measurements. In this case, uh, we determined with our method the probability distributions of absolute magnitudes and phase coefficients, and we apply the priors directly in case of absolute magnitudes and through this way in the case of the, of the slopes, uh, obt obtaining new probability distributions for absolute magnitudes and phase coefficients. This basically, this is what we've done. The, the original computation give this space, the nominal value value is this, this is the median, this is the uncertainties. The uncertainties always are considered uh, between the 16th and the 84th uh, percentiles, meaning comprising the 64% comprising the, the of the data. And after applying the priors, the uh, absolute magnitude gets a little bit brighter, which as I showed you before, this is good because the, 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 linear, the linear approach tends to underestimate a little bit the, the, the magnitude and the, the uncertainties as well get, uh, get smaller. Get, in fact, the uncertainties get a lot, a lot better. This is the original uncertainties and in blue are the uncertainties after applying the, the priors. This is in absolute magnitude. I mean, it's dramatic in phase coefficient where it, it gets really, really well, really, really good. And these are these are the results of this work. These are the the the, the phase to be the the phase magnet, the phase curves uh, up to seven point half degrees. Uh, I want to, to to show you this particular case here in the R filter because in our 2020 in our 2022 paper we didn't compute R magnitude. So we have priors for this set of filters, but not for this one. So whenever using this one, we get just the original data. So that was, that's why in this case, it looks so widely different than in the other. So applying priors tend to homogenize a little bit the, the values. They don't make it all the, the same, but that's not what I mean. It just tends to homogenize a little bit and to get it closer to using a, a more complex photometric model. Once we got the absolute colors, we went to, to see if we had anything, anything similar than we would seen. And in fact, we do. This is for different, this is U minus G, G minus I, R minus I, no, uh, G minus R, R minus I, and I minus Z. And we detect the same kind of pattern in every pair of filters. And in particular, using HV minus HR, we recover exactly pretty much the same thing than for the TNOs we saw in 2018 and 2019. So uh, in this case, we have in, in red, objects that are big over 100 kilometers or up to 2000 kilometers in diameter. Uh, some of them are covered in ices, different kinds of ices, water, methane, whatever, uh, very far away in the solar system at temperatures 
below 50 to 40 kelvins. And here we have in black, we have asteroids that are a lot closer in the main belt in between two and three astronomical units, uh, warm air surface that are more covered in rock. And we have exactly the same behavior. Uh, the, the only solution we came out here is that uh, closer to a position, we are actually seeing uh, an effect of, of uh, surface property, of the microscopic properties. In, and in this case, uh, we propose that it may be due to the size of the, of the, of the scatterers that, that are in the surface. I'm not an expert on the scatterers on, on, on the physical scattering of the surfaces. So that would be nice if uh, uh, a theoretician could look into this and, and give more insight into what's going on. Uh, we also wanted to address, because this plot here, basically with, 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 with says in, in lame words, is that uh, intrinsically bluer objects tend to get redder with increasing phase angle, and intrinsically redder objects tend to get bluer with increasing phase angle. The, we wanted to see if this, uh, we wanted to see this from the point of view of the photospectra. We have the photospectra, we have the, the, the collection of, of, uh, of magnitudes for the different phase angles. So we computed the spectra for, for the different phase angles for each object we could do it. We used the Akari Aldido as well to, to renormalize, so to, to, to remove the effects of the normalization because uh, for those that are not familiar to the spectroscopy of the small bodies, we usually just, we, we, we never, um, we never calibrate them in flux. We just normalize them at a, at a, at a wavelength, usually the D filter or the R filter, and we compare them normalized. To remove this normalization that could be introduced in some artifacts, we use the albedos in the V filter, and with that, we, we, we remove this and put them into a more, say, physical scale. And uh, we computed for each photospectrum different phase angle, its, uh, its slope, just a linear slope, and computed its change with the phase angle. And uh, this is basically the slope of the uh, at zero phase angle, just using the, 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 absolute, the absolute colors. Uh, and we obtained exactly the same thing for a less dense database because we had less albedos, just it was about a hundred objects. Um, the same thing, objects that are intrinsically bluer, meaning that the, phase, the, 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 the slope at zero phase angle is blue, uh, in the, like, like this basically, they, they tend to get redder when increasing phase angle, while objects that are intrinsically red, they tend to get bluer with phase angles, with increasing phase angles. This is valid only up to 7.5 degrees, which is the, 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 the span of our database. Um, so instead of calling it red, phase reddening, I, I think it should be called phase coloring because we are going both ways. Although it's phase reddening is uh, it's very well adopted in the community and it's, uh, I don't know if it's gonna be easy to change this. So uh, to finish, uh, just, uh, a couple of a few a few sentences um, that I want to, to to stress here. The first one is we uh, for the first time we are doing uh, taxonomy at zero phase angle. We are removing this bias. We have a lot of other biases certainly, like discovery biases, because it's easier to observe brighter objects than fainter and brighter than and bigger than smaller. Yeah, sure. We will deal with the, we will deal with these biases later on. But at least we are removing one that's been affecting the data since the since the taxonomy has been presented, and it's a problem that has not been put forward until until I heard Karim Monem speak about it. Basically, uh, phase coloring I, I've shown you in at least in the range between zero and seven point half degrees, uh, it can go either way. A surface can get bluer or can get red. So whenever uh, Presenting data, whenever presenting data uh, as, as a snapshot, it should be considered this. Depending on the phase angle, it, it's it's um, it's intrinsic color may, may may change. So this should be included. Uh, we are in the I, uh, we are in the process you know, of including other databases of other surveys, in particular, uh, increasing the wavelength coverage like uh, JPass or or J, J, J plus. Or, or of course uh, LSST when it comes, which is going to observe basically the same filters as, as Lawrence. So it's going to be 
very interesting. Problem is it's very it's a very slow processing of the data. Uh, um, I think we were looking at least into, into this uh, last work we've done and with the TNOs because we're looking into the microscopic properties of surface. And I think this is worth exploring to actually check if there is something there happening with this. And uh, also to make me more comfortable with myself because ever since we discovered this, uh, this anti-correlation, we've been trying to uh, discard any sort of systematic that may happen and that may be affecting our data. In the last five years, this is, that was discovered in 2018, in the last five years, we have not come out with anything that uh, is affecting our data. So it looks like this is real, this is happening. So this should be studied in, in a way different than only observation. And it should be studied in a laboratory or <clears throat> theoretically or numerically or whatever. That's something that escapes my, that escapes my my expertise. Um, just finally, all, all the software presented here is available and the data all is in, in CDS. So uh, feel free to, if anyone's interested in this, just request me or go to the to the link of the papers and you'll find it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alvaro, for this uh, nice talk. And now the talk is open for questions, please, here in the room and also in uh, Zoom. Thank you, Alvaro, for this very nice, very simple talk. But my question is there. Uh, Gaia data is already uh, providing some kind of new information or is able to help you to get a better, you know, better results or even uh, expanding the result to uh, more, more objects in the future. And Gaia is very useful. In fact, uh, Milagros and Rene have worked with the face curve from there. The problem with Gaia is that it cannot observe below 10 degrees in the face curve. So it's, it's, it's observing in, uh, let me put this. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm going to put the curve of uh, Massalia, which is, it's very illustrative. Uh, Massalia, Massalia, Massalia. Hey. So basically Gaia is observing this part here. So it, it doesn't observe this part. So we have to, but that was a clever thing in, in, in the world that uh, the is very high. Yeah, and interpolation is going to give you anything. So you have to complete this with ground based observations. On the other hand, you may say, okay, you have spectroscopy as well. That can help you in the, in the multi wavelength thing. Yeah, sure. But the spectroscopy they're providing is average over different. They just compile different, all observations of one object and they just average it and provide it. So there's no phase correction there. So I personally wouldn't use prima facie those spectra because they're affected by phase coloring. And in an unknown way, you, we don't know how. It's just there, and I take it with. It, it will work well to to see if they have uh, an absorption band or not. But uh, just for the sake of uh, composition and mapping, I I'm looking okay. for. Okay. But that's good because otherwise it's going to kill us. <laughs> you say, but it's, it's an average value, so we can do it you know, afterward. You can get some kind of. General information will be ready, but not for this kind of exactly, research. exactly, exactly. This other kind of service I need for this. LST is going to be great for this. Okay. Uh, yeah, what do you mean with the microscopic uh, properties of the surface? Is what? the particle sizes or porosity or compactness or? Uh, well, I. I for, from my point of view, from my little understanding of this, is the size of the, of the, the size distribution of the, the particles. Uh, I've read a lot of this. Most of it is very hard to understand, I'm going to admit. And uh, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, the thing is, this uh, observation at different wavelengths. On the different wavelengths, uh, you are seeing particles, uh, the, 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 the the light is interacting mostly with particles of slightly different sizes. So my, my, my bet is that 
whenever we're going to from G to R to I or whatever sort of filter or filtering we're moving, we are looking always at the bigger, at the, at the, at the largest particles in each of the distribution. That's what I that's what I feel it's happening here. So when I'm observing a G, I'm observing the biggest of the G, then I move to R and I, I, I still look, I'm still looking at the biggest of the G, but I'm missing some of the G because I cannot see them anymore. Say uh, something like that. I don't know if I can maybe clear. Yeah, okay. so, yeah. so I think this is going on, but yeah. I don't know how to prove it. Mm -hmm. That would be great. No questions. We soon we have questions here. I have one. So when when we compare the asteroid with Tinos, we compare the linear part, but it's the this linear part, the the this, yeah. this is low, exactly, mm -hmm. not the, the other one. No, 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 no. We don't get it. So this is not linear. Exactly. I'm assuming this as a, I'm assuming a linear behavior because it's easier. And for, 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 for the simulation, you get a decent value of the absolute magnitude, but not a good description of the curve. That's what I think. Okay, more questions? No question here. No question in Zoom. So seeing none. Thank you very much, Albert, again, and mm -hmm. uh, see you all on the next seminar on Thursday. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, awesome.